it's a pleasure to be on your channel mm -hmm. well thank you for agreeing to come and to come i think i think you being here makes it harder for me to start. i totally understand that i, I think when i'm doing this on my own i just yeah, feel like i, I my completely normal understand that i okay. feel like in closet coaching i'm more like yeah i could just talk yeah. but not when i feel it's funny yeah. maybe we should just start talking to each other and then you can decide where like to actually begin it sure yeah. probably quite a few people here might recognize this face this is steph who i do the podcast with life after diets if you haven't checked it out you might want to steph and i thought it might be fun was it fun the right word to come on and talk about our binge eating recovery and swap experiences and swap notes if you like on how each of us recovered because i talk about this a lot on my channel but i'm talking about it from my perspective so even though I work with a, lots of different people, I think I'm probably still quite biased when it comes to binge eating recovery. And that's one of the reasons why they say as like a therapist, be careful what you mm. specialize in if you've had experience in it, because... Wait, how do you feel biased? Like towards what worked for you and what didn't? Well, this idea that we can only see life through our own frame of reference. Yeah. So my own experience of binge eating is going to... I'm looking at everyone else's experience of binge eating through that lens... That doesn't mean I can only see my own experience, but do you know what that means? It like, yeah, yeah, filters it. Yeah. I have a question for you. Okay. You know how, I mean, cause I've talked before about my, like I literally started binge eating recovery one day. It was my birthday. But did you have like a, a point of initiation or was it this gradual melting pot of strategies that over time started to work? I think it was gradual. Um, I've done, I've actually done a video, I'll link to it above, called The Three Turning Points in My Recovery. And I would say that there were different realizations that I had along the way. I think one of the most crucial realizations that I remember having was how I didn't relate to any of this talk about restriction causes binge eating. It didn't make sense to me. I thought I'm not restricting. I know, I know I'm eating too much because my weight is increasing. And then when I heard about this idea of even just thinking about restricting could trigger off binge eating. Even that planning to restrict, this idea that the brain is anticipating. So all I had to do was go to bed telling myself tomorrow, I'm only going to eat X, Y, Z, and that was a restricted amount. I'd wake up the next morning and the minute I felt like I'd blown it, which I inevitably did because it wasn't enough food, that was when that all or nothing, what the hell effect came in and I was just binging over and over again. Like the intuitive eating last supper. Lots yeah, of mental things. restriction. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I had no idea that mental restriction could be that powerful. Okay. That, that mentally restricting could affect your, my biology in that way, because that's what it felt like. It does. I mean, that it, it feels like it hijacks you almost, almost in the same way as physical restriction. I would say sometimes it's comparable. Um, but so you're, you were binge eating, mm -hmm. feeling out of control, but collecting these kinds of concepts that over time started to make sense in, as a whole? Yes, okay. and I would say I moved in and out of hmm. uh, recovery. I would sometimes, I, I tried to, rather than thinking about it as this linear journey, I was thinking about it, I was in recovery or I was in binge eating, and I was just moving between these two positions. And for me, it was about that period of time where I was in a more recovered place with food. Those periods of time got longer and longer. Okay. Because to begin with, it might just be, a week or two of feeling balanced with food and then at some point I would tip back into chaos for a month yeah. and that just it started to shift until being in that more recovered state just started to feel like my natural state okay but I'm thinking just sort of looping back just for anybody here who's not seen you before and not heard yeah. anything about your story do you just want to give an overview of your, your disordered eating where it started how long sure. for and the different eating disorders you went through sure so I started restricting in my teenage years and adolescence um i was just dieting and dabbling in dieting and overeating for a while and then i became um what would be classified as anorexia i was diagnosed with anorexia um and then my parents caught wind of that and got concerned and, and said like you can't play sports anymore you can't do these things anymore and i was like okay i kind of i got afraid it incited some fear um about like what i was doing to myself and immediately it snapped into binge eating. So I remember um, just like walking into my kitchen one day and where I had been very methodical about restricting and counting calories and having like mustard on rice cakes. Um, I, I know, I, um, I just dove into a bowl of pasta salad. I remember this. 
um, and ate the whole thing. And I was like, what was that? Like, I, I just, I didn't understand it as binge eating. I didn't want it. I don't think I, I, I don't know if I remember if I knew what the term was at the time, but I just, that wasn't a place I wanted to be, but it kept happening. So I kept moving from restriction. I would try to get, get it back together and then move right into binge eating. Eventually that turned into bulimia. Um, and then it moved in my twenties, it moved right. It just was binge eating where it was more like there was no active restriction that I understood as restriction. It was just day after day of binge eating and every morning waking up thinking today's going to be the day that I get it together. I was also dealing with depression a lot at that time. So I had a lot of high hopes for how this all was going to save me. If I could figure out eating, I'd be happy to binge ate um, pretty straight through um, my 20s and into my 30s, at which point I started having kids and got into orthorexia, which, you know, I became obsessed with clean eating and providing for my kids in this way that was like healthy. And then I absorbed that as well. And that then fueled my binge eating further. And then it became a binge restrict pattern um, in my later 30s, where I was um, using fasting, like intermittent fasting and clean eating um, I was a health coach. I was um, anti-sugar, dairy-free, gluten-free, all these things. So I would be very strictly restricting physically and mentally. And then I would um, have these very, very, very large binges. In fact, probably the largest binges I had out of my whole career of binge eating existed in that time. And that's what led up to my eventual um, exhaustion and recovery and realizing I had been doing this pattern of, with food since I was 15 years old, 14 or 15 years old, and that that wasn't really changing. It was just taking new shapes. Mm -hmm. That wasn't very <laughs> succinct. <laughs> um, that's okay. It is hard to be succinct though, isn't it? Yeah. Because it, it's such a, a vortex of different types of disordered eating. Can you remember though, the first time you heard the term binge eating? I think I discovered it because I was very into like research. I still am. So I would Google everything and I would, although Google wasn't around, it was like Yahoo, <laughs> I think, or whatever Ask that one Jeeves. Before. Did you have Ask Jeeves? Jeeves. You did I asked Jeeves. I didn't know if that was what a British What was going thing. on with me? I was like, Jeeves. Um, yeah, and I think the term came in. I think I'd known the word binge. I don't know if I'd known it as a disorder, but I didn't want to relate to it. So I was like, no, it's bulimia. It's bulimia. Um, but I, but I, but then later I was like, no, this is binge eating. This is exactly what I'm doing. I just there. I, I just decided to own it at some point. Um, it was shameful. I, I was ashamed to be binging. I wanted to be. I wanted to have an eating disorder, which like, even you know, like it, it just doesn't seem like an eating disorder. It seems like this other thing. Mm -hmm. um, but no, fully relate. I identify more as a binge eater than anything else, mm -hmm. really. Yeah, same. And and it was the same for me as well. I, I was going to say Google, but maybe it wasn't Google. Maybe it was something else. I can remember having these uncontrollable urges to eat and getting up in the middle of the night and eating. I had a lot of nighttime eating going on with my binge eating as well as eating during the day. Mm -hmm. And I just remember, yeah, on this research front page and reading about this binge eating disorder. And this would have been back in 2008, 2009 kind of time. Um, and it was, yeah, there wasn't much on the internet about it. There certainly wasn't people talking about it on social media. There wasn't even social media. Or maybe probably. there was, I wasn't into it yet. Yeah, that's no, probably was... Facebook, but it was when Facebook was literally just for your friends back then. There yeah. was no adverts on Facebook. Do you remember when Facebook had no adverts? Uh, yeah, I remember when it was just for college kids. Yeah. I wasn't in college, so I wasn't part of the club. I was on MySpace. I never had a MySpace page, but I do remember MySpace. <laughs> We're showing our age now. <laughs> I think, you know what? I know when I first identified with binging. It's with Janine Roth. Oh, okay. okay. I, I read a books by Janine Roth, who was like the original dis discussion point of mm -hmm. this. And she helped, I think I went to her retreats and I devoured her books and that was where I was like, okay, <laughs> if she, if she can call it that, I can call it that. Mm -hmm. Um, because that's what it was. So one of the questions I'm going to ask it to you, like I often hear it asked to me, people want to know, what did you actually do to recover from binge eating? Yeah. They wanted you to be really specific about that question. Well, I did. I, for me, it was this thing I had been learning about. The anti-diet message, it was like the first exposure I'd had to not restricting food and understanding how my patterns were being, my, my binges were being fueled by restricting physically and mentally. So I understood those as concepts. So for a few months, because I had gotten to a point in like this, the spring, it was like this time of year, um, in like April, maybe like March and April, I was really absorbing all that information on the internet and in social media, I was dabbling. 
And I was like, oh, this is, this is a whole new way of thinking about my relationship with food. What if I didn't restrict it? What if restri not restricting comes before the not binging? This was novel. So I, but I wasn't ready for that. So I just like listened for a while and, and like thought about it. And the more I thought about it, the more I was restricting and binging and restricting and binging. And it got to this point of like, oh, I just couldn't, I remember feeling like, I had three kids at this point and I was like, I, 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 I cannot anymore. I, I am, I am so, this is my entire life and this will be my entire life if this doesn't stop somewhere. So on my birthday, uh, which is in June, my mom, we were going to my parents' house and like having like cake and like dinner. And I said, when I, I'm going to have my birthday cake my mom makes for me and I'm not going to follow up on June 8th with restriction. Like I'm going to, so literally that day, I was like, I'm gonna eat now and I'm not gonna restrict. And that's actually what happened. Like I had the cake, I had, I remember having three huge pieces of cake, like like half the cake <laughs> and being like, I'm just having this. Like I'm not calculating tonight. I'm not going into that. Um, I think I did calculate, but I didn't do anything about it. So like on June 8th, like, Monday morning it wasn't it was actually a Monday morning I think mm -hmm. whatever the next day was I just had breakfast <laughs> um and lunch and many other foods I mean and I I just and from that day forward I never actively restricted what would you normally have done would you normally have fasted afterwards yes or, uh -huh. I would have calculated how much I ate calorically mm -hmm. and I had this number of what was an acceptable amount of calories based on how much I was exercising okay and I had to even it out so the whole thing was a big math problem my whole life was a math equation and it was like how many days do I have to fast to get down to this number so to make that the average mm -hmm. and sometimes I would allow myself a little bit of food so I'd have to fast a little bit longer if I was like no I can't fast for three whole days I'll just have to fast for five but I have a little less each day um yeah, it was math. It was math. And I don't even like math. So it was, <laughs> but I just decided to not. And that's what happened. And every time I was, I mean, of course I was tempted to restrict. Like it was, I realized at some points, like I could just opt out and go back to what I was doing. But then I realized then I would have to go back to what I was doing. So I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really hard. It wasn't like this easy decision where I like, you know, just stopped and that was that. And I was happy, you know, moving on with my life. It was a decision every day to not do that. Um, but I was, it was a lot of curiosity. I was like, what happens when, when I do this? Like, will this work? To me, it was like an, a, a bit of an experiment. And I also said, if after a year this isn't working, I go back. So I had an out and that was meaningful to me. I needed an out. In the meantime, I was willing to say like, this is something I haven't tried before. Let's just see. And I also remember getting the advice, enjoy it. Like if you're gonna eat and not restrict, like, have fun, like mm -hmm. enjoy the food. Like you get to eat again the next day. To me, this was like, all right, I'll try this for a while. Um, lots of tears. I mean, it's not as easy as I'm making it sound in, um, of course, but it was, it was this like a day of initiation and onward. Because as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking it's almost like for me, it was, I feel like my personality was almost just wired to binge. So I have this very, like this, for me, a lot of the recovery work was working on this this streak, this almost characteristic part of me that's like, if I can't do this, then screw everything. Yeah. Like that, that is, that is on. If I can't, if I can't eat well enough, if my body can't be small enough, if I can't get to where I want to get, like there's a part of me that just wants to collapse in a heap of despair. Yeah. Which is the perfectionistic thinking. And I never related to being a perfectionist because I used to think a perfectionist was about Perfect. doing things perfectly. Yeah. And I was pretty slapdash in the way that I did things. So we were talking about this earlier. I taught Steph what the word slapdash was because it's quite a British thing, apparently. And I'm slapdash. Yeah, we're both quite <laughs> slapdash. But, you know, um, pr I'm prone to feeling guilty about being more just slapdash in my approach because I feel like I should be being more thorough. Um, so that's why I feel like my the restriction part was definitely an element of it. But for me, it went much, much deeper. And so I felt like, like binge eating was just almost this manifestation of how I was living, how I was relating to life. So because it'd be interesting to talk about like the support that we got, because I 
was training to be a therapist. So I, I had years of therapy. And whilst I felt like for years, just going round and round in circles and the binge eating wasn't improving, what was happening in, happening in that time was I was getting to understand my patterns better. When we're talking and reflecting, we're becoming like the watchers of ourselves. So you go in and you're talking to a therapist, you are taking a bit of time to like zoom out and look at something with somebody else. And so that was useful in that aspect. But because I hadn't dealt with the mental restriction side in therapy, because I didn't work with any specialists, the binge eating mm. just went on and on and on. But I'm right in thinking that you worked with a coach. Was this, um, like at what point in your recovery was that? What you're describing is actually what my twenty, my late teens and 20s was. I was working with a therapist and, and identifying patterns of my behavior, like my perfectionism. I didn't call it that though. Like my black and white thinking, my catastrophic thinking, um, my tendency to self-sabotage as I called it at that time. And my like in, I, I couldn't deal with failure. And all of that, I felt like I was growing and evolving as a human, but not as a binge eater. Like I would continue the binges and they, they couldn't pair. I almost wonder sometimes if this is an age thing for me where like, I didn't work with a coach to recover from binge eating. I worked with a coach for body image. Um, mm -hmm. But that, it was almost like all of these concepts that I've been learning in my along the way suddenly came together during this time of recovery where I'd a lot where I'd given myself this year I, I wonder if it had to do with just enough time of all of these concepts making sense and then once I was also addressing the restriction that's when they could and I do think of it like that I think about how that restriction piece was the one thing I wasn't I wasn't conscious of that role so it once that part got addressed it made me feel I suddenly began to understand all the other concept concepts in context and I could apply them finally because prior to that I understood them intellectually like yes this is black and white thinking but couldn't do anything with it, it, it the binge would happen anyway it was like it was too big of a force so I couldn't and not only just based in restriction but in the mental part because I felt like a failure all the time and I felt like someone who would collapse on themselves I identified as a depressed, even though at this at the time I recovered, I was anxious. I identified as a depressed, um, at, like disappointing failure. That's what I thought I was. So I might as well. Like the binge was inevitable because that's who I was inevitably. So, but once restriction got addressed, there was something about seeing that and challenging that that started to be able to happen. Mm -hmm. So that's when I feel like all the melding of concepts occurred in that year when restriction became part of the, the also the approach. Mm -hmm. So much of your life was around chasing thinness and a certain body type, right? Yeah. So recovery meant giving that up. And I think this is what yeah. a lot of people struggle with. So why for you, why recover if it meant not getting the thing that you had spent couple of decades pursuing? Because of the exhaustion. Because I was approaching 40 and I had kids, girls, who were beginning to watch me eat. And although I say that, I mean, that was a piece of it, but it wasn't enough. But I felt like the exhaustion of what I was doing was, was becoming more and more my entire, entire life. And there was this, almost this calling towards authenticity that started to happen as I got older and I started to realize I am just living my life for something else. Like I'm living for this idea of me and it's not me. It's clearly not me. It would have, I would have been this spelt, whatever, you know, sent picture I had of myself by now, if that was supposed to be what I was supposed to be. I started to understand that I had, might have, might have other inclinations. Like I was in a job that I didn't resonate with anymore. And so a lot of ideas about like, what do I really want? Who am I really? Like, what, what am I chasing that doesn't feel true? Started to come in, I think, just from an existential point of view, like at that point in my life. And food is a part of that and so is body image. So I began to question like, what is this idea of who I think I'm supposed to be versus what I actually am and who I am? And so part of that acceptance of gaining weight was me, I, and it wasn't, spelled out like this in the front of my mind. I realized this later, but it was, I think I was being pulled towards, I want to just be me, sustainably me. Like I want to be who I actually am without chasing something anymore. And part of that was 
my body. Um, mm -hmm. And I still think of it like that. It's there's days where I have, you know, where I'm, I don't feel great. Like I'm like, oh, I wish my body was different, but I also don't wish it was different so much that I'm willing to sacrifice myself for it. Um, and that is the biggest change. Yeah. I think for me that I was chasing a feeling through the whole thing, through binge eating, through the pursuit of weight loss, all that. I was chasing a feeling and just wanting to feel comfortable. And I know you and I have talked about that word peace, but for me, okay. So I seven like peace, but you said you don't trust peace. Yeah. Cause the shoes, other shoes going to drop. Yes, and I was thinking about this the other day. So on the podcast, we had this conversation. I was talking about peace. And Steph was saying, even when she experiences something of peace, there's part of her that doesn't doesn't trust it. It's not going to last. And I think we were trying to define it. I can't remember if we managed to define it on that episode or not. But for me, when I was thinking about this the other day, what peace is for me is just not being in conflict with myself. So it is an absence of conflict. And when I'm not in conflict with myself or resisting life in conflict with yeah. life, the result of that is peace. Well, you know what I've learned from you? And actually since that conversation, because even as we talk about that word and that conversation now, I realize that my thoughts have evolved around it. Um, you talk about things as states of feeling, like that you can move in and out of. And I think when I would think of peace, I would think about it as, okay, the pieces, of, the not peace, the pieces of my life <laughs> Are, in, are, are stacked in such a way that I feel like everything's under control, right? So that would be, and that, that would make me feel like, okay, now I'm peaceful. And inevitably that's going to shift. So now I see it as, if I feel peace, like I will move in and out of feeling peace all the time anyway. Like it's not like this place I'm gonna get to to stay. Like I'm not gonna unpack my bags there and assume that that's where I'm gonna be for the rest of my life. It's just, I now feel more in touch with appreciating when I'm in that state of feeling, not expecting that that's going to be my permanent state of feeling. I see, I see. But it, it was when it was coming together in my mind the other day, I thought that is it. When there's no conflict, for me, the result is peace. Yeah, I get that. And so what I realized on this, this journey, and I remember like, Megan Jane Crabb's work really helped me with this as well. I thought, oh my goodness, like what if it's just like okay to except the body I've got. I felt like I wasn't, I shouldn't be allowed to do that yeah. because that's not what other people would expect. It's not what anyone else seemed to be doing. Everyone else around me was just always, you know, a lot of diet talk and diet culture that we live in. Um, yeah, and I think so for me, that part was realizing that I could, if I just got out of that conflicted state and said, okay, I'm not gonna have a conflict about this, I could feel peace. Yeah. And I, I, I Genuinely, I'm not very good at holding on to it all the time. It's a practice. I'm working on it. But I feel like when I go through life and I'm experiencing tension or stress or whatever it might be, if I can find the conflict, find the resistance and just let it go, I get peace. So it's even like, let's say I'm not feeling well and I'm feeling stressed about feeling unwell. If I accept feeling like it's that word acceptance. I know, again, like we're going back to some people don't like the word acceptance. It means, and if you, it feels like giving up. But for me, it feels like I'm not going to get in a conflict with this. And when I'm not in a conflict with myself or with life, I feel how I want to feel. And realizing that that was available because it was about in here and not so much out there. Yeah. That was uh, transformative for me. Yeah. This choice of it. I think that for a long time, having like that, the thought of that wouldn't have made sense to me because I didn't feel it was a choice. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for a lot of, people that's generally like this idea of I want to get to this place of not having that conflict but I can't I can't not have that conflict like that conflict just exists so I mean what do you say to how how do you I I can understand it personally as a it, it felt like a choice at some point of me saying what if I don't sit here and judge myself like that's an option that I didn't know I had mm -hmm. but I remember at a certain point feeling like that wasn't an option yeah and I, I don't even realize it was it's an option in the moment because I well, this ego and my ego wants to yeah. identify with certain things and yeah. sometimes I want something to be a certain way and when it's not if a, uh, a plane is delayed or something happens and like that tension that annoyance comes up it doesn't always occur to me in that moment to go oh if I let go of resistance here I could feel peace about this sometimes it does when I arrived here so I'm in New Jersey at the moment in Steph's home visiting her um, when I arrived in the US the queue for immigration was about an hour and a half 
Um, it was this massive queue and I stood there and on some days I might have felt stressed about it, but I was like, I'm just, I refused to get myself in a conflict about it and I accepted it and I just stood there and waited and it was fine. But that doesn't mean I could do it every time. I have stood in queues before and fumed and got stressed and impatient yeah. as well. Well, I think when it comes to body image, there's also the piece of, of ego and identity. So mm -hmm. it's like in that, in, in the not having conflict of it, you're also saying like, I accept perhaps not being at the top of some kind of hierarchy that I've always imagined that I wanted to be at or not being seen as something that other people see thin people as mm -hmm. um and where the, the identity piece gets wrapped in it and the ego I think that that's why body image is a particularly tough one to like just have this acceptance around and part of I believe what I how I came to be able to make that choice at times was to work on that identity piece it yes. was not just a it was questioning that and questioning what I was depending on for my value for a while mm -hmm. um, before it was like, well, I can choose. I had to develop a, a different sense of myself um, because prior I had just been ident I identified as my, my value is my appearance. That's my primary value. So to ask to give that up was like, no, I can't do that. That's yes. completely ridiculous. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I think the other piece of that is around what's in your control and what's not. Acute immigration. Like, there's no part of me that's going, I should be able to do something about this cue. I know I can't. But I think when it comes to body image or changing mm -hmm. your body, there was a part of me, and even like sometimes now a voice might come up that thinks like, you should be able to do this. Like, some yeah. people do, or you might go into that comparison thing to be, well, why do I always struggle with binge eating every time I try to control my food? I should be able to control without binging. And that for me was the lesson in humility which I'm dropping Great in podcast episode. Coming up this week. <laughs> this Wednesday, it's coming yeah. up. We did an episode all about humility because for me, actually, humility was a big, a massive part of a lesson that I had to learn and continue to learn over and over again because humility for me is a, a kind of a, comes with that release as well and is very much associated with mm. peace. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, we leave it there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we'll have a part two someday. Yeah. If people want it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how this does. <laughs> when you come to London, we'll yes. do one then. Okay. But yeah. Okay. So thank you for watching. Check out the Life After Diets podcast. <laughs> that was really cheesy. <laughs> no. uh, available on all podcast platforms. Yada yada. <laughs>